Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our webinar. And sorry about the last minute switch, but Johnny had to go to a trade show. So Mark Rich kindly stepped in to, to fill in for him. Uh, my name is Tara Willsworth. You've received the emails from me to encourage you to attend these webinars and, and other marketing emails. I do marketing at Prospient. Um, I facilitate the webinars, but my role here is to support Mark as the, as the webinar goes through. So anytime you have a question, please put it in the chat and I will read it out during the presentation so we can answer it real time. We've allowed plenty of time for questions, so please feel free to add them in the, in the chat box and we'll address them at the same, at the, as you ask them. Uh, we, the presentation itself will probably only take about 30 minutes, but we have allowed that time for questions. So feel free to ask whatever questions you like. This webinar is, the, is part two. Johnny started off last week with um, the basics of a greenhouse versus a warehouse. And then Mark is going to continue with what you need inside each of those buildings. So with that, I'll take it away and let Johnny, uh, <laughs> let Mark take it away. All right, thanks, Tyra. Um, so, hey everybody, my name is Mark Rich. Um, I've been with Prospient for four years now. I have a degree in environmental engineering from the University of Cincinnati. And my role at Prospient is really focusing on systems integration. So that includes benching, lighting, irrigation, HVAC, um, really everything that goes into the cultivation facility other than the actual structure. Um, so what we're going to be going through here a little bit is just some of the equipment and all the stuff that would go into these different types. Um, but before we do that, in case anybody missed part one last Tuesday, wanted to go through a quick recap, um, just review of what we talked about from last Tuesday. So really, when it comes to cultivating cannabis, from our side, outside of outdoor grow, we have these four solutions. Um, so the first one being the hybrid greenhouse. So this is going to be a greenhouse, a vented greenhouse. It's going to have a polycarbonate or a glass roof. So this is going to utilize that natural sunlight, which is going to allow you to save some money and have some operational efficiency in your cultivation. Um, basically, your temperature and humidity is controlled by using vents. So you're moving outside air into your facility. So where this really plays a key role is anywhere west of that of the Mississippi River, where the natural humidity is almost always lower than 50 percent or any basically lower than what you're looking to have in your grow zone. So you're able to pull in that outside air and utilize it as a dehumidification aspect of it. Um, with this hybrid greenhouse, you're going to have some limited T limited CO2 supplementation due to venting. So you can add CO2 into these zones but you're going to be venting your greenhouse. So you're pulling in outside air, releasing some of that inside air from exhaust fans, and that's going to limit your CO2 supplementation, basically to just atmospheric concentrations. The second one is also a greenhouse, but it's more of a sealed greenhouse. So this is almost always going to have a glass roof on it. So it's going to use kind of similar as a hybrid greenhouse. It's going to use that natural sunlight. So you're going to have that operational efficiency as you would as any greenhouse does. But with this one, it's completely sealed, so you're not pulling in outside air to dehumidify and change the temperature in your grow zone. This is going to be 100% controlled by the HVAC equipment in the facility. Um, and with this, since it's sealed, you're not venting, you can have supplementation, CO2, upwards of 1,500 to even 1,800 parts per million in there without losing it due to venting. And then the third one's gonna be the indoor grow. So this is gonna be a new build. This is gonna be, you want an indoor grow, you're starting from scratch, building the whole facility. So this can either be a greenhouse with insulated metal panel on top, a concrete or a brick building, um, really any type of building that isn't allowing sunlight coming in. So with this, you have 100% control of all your environmental parameters. You're able to cultivate year round with maximum turns. Um, so with this, you're supplying all the lighting, the entire HVAC system, everything like that, the outside environment has no effects on your yields and you should be able to grow and get the same turns throughout the entire year, no matter the season. Um, and then the last one is gonna be the indoor grow warehouse. So this is basically an indoor grow, but it's created through retrofitting an existing property. So this is maybe you bought an old Kmart that ran out of business or you have an old strip mall and you're retrofitting that to basically create a cannabis indoor cultivation facility. Um, 
The big thing with this is the location proximity. So usually when you're buying these existing facilities, they're going to be a lot closer to where your workers are able to come in and not have to drive an hour out to the middle of nowhere to work for the day. Um, so the location for your workers is a lot easier, as well as the product that you're growing. You're able to ship it out and get it to your customers a lot quicker than if you were an hour into the cornfields. Um, so now I'm going to kind of go into the exact equipment that goes into all of these ones. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is a hybrid greenhouse. So the hybrid greenhouse, the big thing about this is going to be your pad and fan wall. So this is going to have a pad wall on one side and it's going to have exhaust fans on the other side. And this is going to use those exhaust fans to pull air through your grow zone. So it's going to pull air through those evaporated cooling pads and it's going to pull it all the way to the end of the other side where those exhaust fans are. So you're getting rid of the existing air in your facility and pulling in new outside air through those evaporated cooling pads to cool off your entire grow area. Um, this utilizes the cooling effect producing that's produced when water evaporates. So you're going to have water running through those evaporated cooling pads and it's effectively going to help cool. It's effectively going to help cool your entire um, grow zone. And then when it comes to hybrid greenhouses, there's a couple way to have supplementation heating in it. So the first one is just going to be a unit heater, um, very standard unit heater. You can have a gas unit heater, an electric unit heater. Um, basically, you're just going to hang these up in the zones and it's just going to add heating capacity for your grow zones during these colder months. Um, another one's going to be under bench heat. So this is going to be a little bit more costly than if you were just to add unit heaters into here. Um, so with this, you're going to have, you could have a boiler that's back into your head house that you're running hot water through during these winter months under your benches. Um, you can run them on the sidewalls as well. So that's a very popular option in the hybrid greenhouses. It's just going to be a little bit more costly than the unit heaters. And then a big thing in a hybrid greenhouse is going to be the nighttime dehumidification. Um, so this is going to be a separate standalone system that you can either have inside your corridor outside the facility and then piping it into your grow rooms but essentially this is used during the blackout periods so this is going to add additional dehumidification capacity at night when you have those blackout curtains pulled and you're not effectively pulling air through your cooling pad as much so this is going to allow you to keep your humid humidity levels in that grow room where you want them um, could be just a dehumidifier dehumidifier hanging up in the zone, or you could have the full system with it. When it comes to lighting for these hybrid greenhouses, more than likely you're going to have the HPS option in these. Usually when a grower wants to go with a hybrid greenhouse, they're looking for the most cost effective way to get up and running. And that's going to be your HPS lights. Um, LEDs is still hundred percent an option. It's just going to have a little bit more of that capital cost involved with it. And then kind of, as I was saying earlier, when it comes to CO2, the hybrid greenhouse is going to be the best um, solution for that. Due to the venting, your CO, if you add supplementation or supplemental CO2 into the grow zone, when you vent, that CO2 is just going to go out outside and it's no longer contained in that grow zone. So it's going to be tough to really ever get your CO2 levels to be higher than that atmosphere concentration around 415 parts per million. Um, so that's going to affect your yield a little bit. And that's going to be, that's the biggest downfall of the hybrid greenhouse is going to be those CO2 levels. Um, and when it comes to benching for the hybrid greenhouse, you're going to either have the single tier rolling benching or the stationary benching. So you're not going to have any type of multi-tiered benching or anything in this. Um, and here's some photos that we've, of projects that we've done with some hybrid greenhouses. So up here in the top left, you can see with the roof, they don't have the blackout or shade pool. You have the full sunlight coming in. Um, and that bottom left, or the, the, that's still that top left picture. You can see the unit heater, some vertical air airflow fans, and some HPS lights. Um, the bottom left, you can see the pad wall with the evaporated cooling pads on it. So that's where the air is going to be pulling in from. And then down in the bottom right, you can see a facility that's actively closing that blackout curtain so as you can see you can still completely black out this entire greenhouse and with these you can see the slots of sunlight coming in that's because it's still actively closing but just to kind of show 
the differences with it. The top right up there is going to be those rolling benches with the 13 inch troughs on it. So those are going to be your most standard benching option when it comes to the hybrid greenhouse. Um, and just some some general pictures just to show um, some of the visual learners some about this stuff. So head over to the next slide. And then so the next big one is going to be the sealed greenhouse. So the equipment in the sealed greenhouse is going to be a lot different than if it was in the hybrid greenhouse. Um, generally, a lot of this differences comes from the HVAC um, portion of it. So the, there's a couple different ways you can go about your HVAC and dehumidification systems in the sealed greenhouse. With the first one being the indoor standalone air handler unit. So we're going to call these our indoor standalone AHUs. And what these are going to do is they're going to provide your HVAC and dehumidification treatment using existing air from within the grow zone. So this is not pulling in outside air and cooling it. It is taking air from within the environment cooling it and dehumidifying it, and then putting it back into the zone. So these will be tied to your environmental controller. And basically from there, your set points is going to allow it to function a little bit better. <coughs> um, the next one's going to be the large outdoor standalone desiccant AHUs. So these are going to be really big units that are going to sit outside of your grow zone. And these are going to require a pretty pretty big area outside for this equipment to sit. So this is going to be an all-inclusive unit that's gonna provide heating, dehumidification and cooling for these. And basically how they're gonna work is they're gonna pull outside air in and they're gonna treat it. They're gonna treat it for pests, mold, microbes, anything like that, and then cool it, heat it, dehumidifier, whichever one it technically needs at that moment, and then send it into your zone below your benches. And then it's also gonna pull the hot air from the top of your zones and push those out. Um, you also have the chilled water systems. So this is gonna be where you have a four pipe system. So you have hot water and chilled water hard piped into each zone. So from here, you're gonna have a supply and a return for the hot water and the cold water. And from there, you can really dial in the temperature of these zones because you have both of those running to each zone. Through trial and error, you can basically determine, okay, I need this set point. I need to send X amount of hot water to this zone. This is going to require a boiler and a chiller, and this equipment is going to stay inside the head house. So that equipment, initial equipment cost is going to be a lot more expensive than, say, the hybrid greenhouse where you're just using unit heaters and a patent fan wall. But it's a lot more efficient, and it's a lot more accurate on getting those set points that you want. When it comes to lighting, LED is going to be a lot more common in these than the HPS are. Um, the HPS is still definitely going to be a good option. The only problem with the HPS for these is basically when your AC unit is going to be undersized, where it wasn't designed and engineered correctly the first time, take out that heat from the HPS um, light that it's producing. So you're going to see some trouble cooling your entire facility during the July and August months. Um, and then so for CO2, it's a little bit different than the hybrid because it's completely sealed. So you're going to be able to have a liquid CO2 design, or you can also have CO2 burners for this. When you go with the liquid CO2 design, you're pumping in purified or pure CO2 into your grow zone. Um, you're going to have a CO2 tank and some life safety alarms in there just to ensure everybody's safety is good with it. Um, but it's a lot more efficient. You're able to get those higher parts per million concentrations up in these zones, which allow your yields to go up. When it comes to benching, um, you're going to have single tier rolling or stationary, same as if the hybrid. But you can also have some of the pallet style benches into here. And I'll show a couple pictures of the pallet style benches next. Um, and you also have air purification in this room. So since you're not ve actively venting air to the outside, you can purify the air that's in there. And with this, we typically go with a photocatalytic oxidation filter. Some people use a fan that just has a UV light on it to purify. Um, the PCO filters go one step further, um, but they're both very good technologies with it. And so here's some photos of it. So the top left one up here, you can see the pallet style benching on the bottom with LEDs above it. 
So this pallet style benching doesn't have any legs attached to that bench top. Those bench tops are easily and freely moved throughout the grow zone. So as you can see in the background, it's a little hard to see, but there's a track that you can push those bench tops to, and then you can move them to a different grow zone as well as pulling them into your transfer corridor and everything like that. Um, the one in the middle, top middle up there, you can see there's no exhaust fans or anything on the backside of this. It's completely sealed. So you have your insulated metal on that backside. And then right below that, you can see one of those air handling units. So those are one of the inside air handling units. So you can see the hot water and the cold water being piped into it. These ones are gonna hang above your canopy. Some growers don't like this because it's blocking some of that natural sunlight that's coming in. So the picture on the right over here was a custom design that we did with the company to where we did one of these inside air handler units, but place them under the bench so they're not blocking any of that sunlight coming in. Um, and then, so the next slide. So now we're going to talk about indoor grow. And with this one, I'm going to combine that indoor warehouse and the indoor grow into one since once it's up and running, it's the same equipment going into these. So when it comes to the HVAC and dehumidification side of it all, you've got all the same options that you do in the seal house. You still have the indoor standalone AHUs. You have the large outdoor desiccant AHUs. There's chilled water systems. All three of those are still going to work perfectly fine in the indoor grow as the same as it would for the sealed greenhouse, you're going to have to engineer them a little bit different because your heat loads and everything are going to be a little bit different for an indoor grow as it would as a greenhouse. And it's something to make sure that you discuss with the company you're engineering it with before purchasing anything. But one thing that's different about the indoor grow is you can have these traditional rooftop units. So any commercial building that you're retrofitting they're probably gonna have traditional rooftop AC units already installed there. Usually this is not going to be the initial capacity that you're looking for. Almost every commercial building that has AC heating and all of that already included with it is not actually made for pulling the same amount of water load out as if a cannabis cultivation facility is. So that's really something to pay key attention to is when you're working with a company and you say, Oh, I bought this building that already has HVAC and all the all the above included with it. You really need to make sure that it is sized correctly for what you're trying to do with it all. Um, with this, you might have to add different dehumidifiers to hang in the zone, um, and you may just be able to add additional capacity to it, or you may have to scrap the whole thing. Um, it's different for every scenario, but it's something that you definitely want to look into when trying to build a cannabis facility. And then lighting for this. LED and HPS lights are both common in an indoor grow. Um, it kind of all goes back to tying that into your AC unit. So ensuring that it's sized correctly. So if you have HPS lights, you're able to pull out that additional heat. Um, people are starting to lean more towards LEDs just because of the performance, but the LEDs are also always going to be more expensive. The CO2 design. So with this, you can still have that same liquid CO2 design as you would in the sealed house. Um, so you still got that CO2 tank and life safety alarms. Some people will use uh, just like a Johnson CO2 burner um, for a little bit more of a simpler, more cost effective way. And then the big thing for indoor grows where stuff kind of change is the benching. So you can still have the single tier rolling, stationary or pallet style benches. But the big thing that changes is you're now able to have tiered racking systems. Um, so since you're not having any natural sunlight come in, you can have two tiers for flower, even three tiers, depending on how high, how high the ceiling is in your building. And basically, you can essentially double your yields from a single tier benching layout to a double tier flower um, tiered racking system layout. So with this, it is definitely going to be a higher initial cost but you're able to get those plant densities higher and you're able to get more plants per room because you're doing two tiers or even three tiers with it uh, versus a single tier. So that's a big thing to look at when you're researching into building an indoor grow. And then the air purification is gonna be the same as the sealed greenhouse. We're still gonna be looking at those PCO filters. And so here are some photos of some indoor grows that we've we've worked with so on the left here you can see a three-tier veg rack 
So you can see the LED bar lights on it. So that's going to be per tier. You can still have irrigation per tier. And then above it, you're going to have some type of a vertical air system where you're getting airflow in each tier. Some people like the uh, the metal box design. Some people like the duck sock design. Um, a lot of it's really just whatever the customer is looking for. And with these racks, a lot of the times they're going to be those library style racks where, as you can see, there's that handle that you can turn and those racks are going to move with all the other racks. So you can get those plants a little bit tighter. Um, in the middle here, the top and the bottom, that's going to be one of those outdoor AHU units. So from here, you can see that it's taking space outside, even though this one is a lot smaller than some of the facilities. Some of them will have um, an outdoor equipment that looks 10 times the size of this and requires 10 times that footprint outdoor. Um, but you can see that the air is being pumped into the facility through ducting. So you're still going to be ducting air in and out of these facilities. And this is something that could also be used on those sealed houses. I just put it on the indoor grow. The top right up here, you can see this is just a mother and prop room. That's an indoor grow. So all of the lighting is being supplied through LEDs with this. Um, those mother racks are on rolling benches. And then those prop propagation domes are just on stationary tiered racks. And then the bottom one here. So this would be an, a new indoor grow build. So this would be taking a greenhouse structure and putting insulated metal, metal panel on the roofing. So essentially you're running a sealed greenhouse, but you're putting insulated metal panel on the top. So no sunlight's coming in, making this an indoor grow. So you can see the LEDs on the top with the rolling benches with the troughs on them. You can see the ducting in the far background from those um, standalone desiccant right. systems outside. And even on that left side, you can see one of the air purification units going in here. Um, so that's kind of the separation. With these indoor grows where you want to turn a greenhouse into an indoor grow, you can do it um, for a lower capital cost than if you were to build a brand new concrete or brick building. Um, so these are some photos for visualization of an indoor grow that you could possibly do. Um, and now so for some expenses comparison. We ran through this in part one, but it's really important just to reiterate it. So with the hybrid greenhouse, you're going to have your lowest capital investment and your lowest operational expenses. So for your capital investment, you're looking at anywhere from 200 to $250 per square foot. And for the operational expenses, you're looking at roughly $1.6 million per year. Um, the bad thing about hybrid greenhouses is you also have the lowest yield numbers per year. So you're looking anywhere from 30 to 45 grams per square foot, um, which still isn't bad. This is still a very, very profitable build and cultivation solution. It's just going to be a lot different from these other ones. Um, and then so for the sealed greenhouse, this is going to be your middle middle of the road for both capital investment yield and operational. So when it comes to your capital investments, you're looking anywhere from 280 to $320 per square foot with um, operational expenses about $500,000 more than that hybrid per year at 2.1 million. And your yield estimates can be anywhere from 50 to 70 grams per square foot. Um, a lot of these yield estimates are going to be dependent on strain. Um, and just different different location parameters and stuff like that. The indoor grow is going to be your highest capital investment, your highest operational expenses, but it's also your highest yield. So capital investments anywhere from 350 to $450 per square foot, depending on the type of building you're looking at. Operational expenses about $600,000 more than the sealed greenhouse at $2.7 million per year, but it's um, $1.1 million more per year than the hybrid greenhouse. So the indoor grow is going to be a lot more expensive to operate than the hybrid greenhouse, but the yield estimates 70 to 90 grams per square foot is going to still allow this to be a very profitable cultivation solution. Um, and all of these estimates are based on a 20,000 square foot facility. So, um, so now in summary, just to kind of go through everything again. So, uh, the question of greenhouse versus indoor. Um, what's the answer? And the answer is, is there's really not an exact answer to it. There's a lot of factors that go into it um, and a lot of factors that you really need to consider before making that decision, with the biggest one being location. If you're west of the Mississippi River, a hybrid greenhouse may be the best solution for you. But if you're down in Florida, humidity is upwards of 60 percent on an average day, you may be looking to do a sealed greenhouse or an indoor grow. Um, 
So there's never going to be a perfect answer for this. There's always going to be so many factors to consider. Um, and I hope we've helped cover a lot of these factors during part one and part two of this. And then another one's just going to be understanding capital and operational expenses. So what cultivation solution is going to best fit your business plan? Um, are you going to be able to have the investors to afford, it, afford an indoor grow from day one? Or are you going to need to maybe start with a couple hybrid greenhouses and then as revenue grows, you're able to then maybe switch to an indoor grow? Um, and then building your facility in smaller phases. So a lot of times customers will come up and say they want to build 45,000 square foot of greenhouses and they want to start now. And that's totally fine. We can completely do that for them, but it's going to be a very expensive project. So what we recommend sometimes is maybe building out 15,000 square foot, that first phase, getting up and growing, start producing some revenue for your business, and then immediately go to phase two where you're doing another 15,000 square foot, and then phase three where you're doing another 15,000, and then you have your 45,000. So you're able to produce revenue during all that and help pay for the phases a lot easier with that. Um, and then speed to market is going to be a big thing. So if you know exactly what you want, you're going to be able to save yourself a ton of money, a ton of time and a time, a ton of headaches with trying to deal with people engineering this and designing this here and there. Um, if you're able to get to speed to market three months quicker than if you delayed and wanted to change the entire design, that may cost you two million dollars down the road from just different from losing an entire harvest or anything like that. So there's a lot to consider with that, how, how quick you want to get there. Um, and local regulations and codes, states and counties are always going to have different energy efficiencies. A lot of the times this comes into play with LED versus HPS. So that's something you always want to check in on and make sure you're following correctly. And then last one is just the declining price per pound. So a lot of these developed markets with medicinal and recreational um, usage are already seeing prices per pound drop to $800. And this, this is tough. A lot of people didn't see this coming. Um, but really, like, how does this affect your business down the road? Are you going to be able to produce a pound for under $700 if the price per pound is $800? Are you going to be able to be cost effective and be able to compete when these price per pounds keep dropping? Um, that's a really big thing to look at. And I know Johnny talked about it a little bit more in part one, so I won't go too depth in it. But these are just some of the summary items that we wanted to cover. And I think we're good on the presentation on that part, Tara. Okay. Uh, someone did have a question about downloading the presentation and that's my fault. I should have uploaded it to the attachments in this webinar before we started, but I will do it after the webinar. So you can just come back to this link and download it from here. Um, I did have a question about, I read an article the other day about the cannabis facility where their blackout curtains failed and everybody thought the aliens had invaded because of the light at night. Wouldn't there be some, I mean, are there, I assume there are fines for companies that don't, that do all that light pollution um, if their blackout curtains fail, you know, they don't play, they don't work properly? Yeah, so what I'm, I think you broke up a little bit there. Was your question, what happens when a blackout curtain fails? Yes. Yeah. So cannabis is a photo photo period sensitive plant. So there's even times where if your blackout does occur and you're not getting that exact 12 hours or the 13 hours, whatever you're shooting for of that daylight, the phase, the natural phase of that plant is going to be interrupted. Um, your yields are going to be affected. Your plant's not going to be as good as if it was if you did have it correctly. And to even go a little bit further into that, in some of the indoor grows, you'll see the corridors where the lights, all the lights in the corridor are a green color. They don't have any natural, just regular looking lights in there. And that's because they're not running um, blackout during the night. They can run their lights since they're supplying all the lighting. They can run it whatever 12 hours they want to. And when they open up that door, if somebody doesn't know they're blacking, they're basically in the blackout phase during their the natural light from that corridor, if it's not those green lights, could interrupt that photo period. So by having those green lights, the plant doesn't actually recognize this and you can open that door and still be able to see without having any problems with it. Okay. Kind of like a photograph dark room. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, there, that was the only question we had about downloading the presentation. Does anyone have any other questions? You can just enter it in the chat and Mark will answer. What is your, and this is opinion really, which one is is more popular, greenhouses or indoor growth? Um, so indoor grows is definitely more popular. Indoor grows take up about 80% of the market right now. 80% um, of people who are cultivating cannabis are doing it indoors. Um, this, this may start switching a little bit more towards greenhouse where you can do it at or basically grow a pound at a cheaper operational expense when these markets are starting to have their price per town drop a little bit due to competition. Um, but right now, indoor is definitely king. It's it's 80 to 85 um, percent. And from there, a lot a lot of people will have an indoor grow as well as a greenhouse grow. Um, so they'll have both both um, options available for them um, and they utilize both of them as well. OK, there's a question. How can I properly control BPD with two levels? The table is approximately four, four feet by or oh, four inches. That surely is feet. Um, the the table is approximately four by forty eight by eight. And the question is, how can I properly control BPD with two levels? So I'm assuming that they are talking about a um, a two tier grow here. Um, yeah. And with that, on the tiered rack that I showed earlier, having that vertical fan distribution, that vertical air distribution, we call it BAS, um, that's really going to allow you to break up those microclimates that are forming in there. So when you have those two tiers, having just normal fans above, like say if you were having vertical airflow fans um, in a greenhouse or in a single tier grow where you're pulling air up, well, you can't penetrate the canopy on say a standard two tier because you're you, there's just no room for the air to go up so having those vertical air systems is really going to allow you to break up those microclimates going to allow you to get rid of the heat of the leds that you have above it um, and we've even seen people where they're running the duck sock fans along the side to blow in straight into the canopy of of these tiered growths um, there's a lot of different solutions for it um, and a lot of people are still doing some testing on all of that. Okay. I think we've captured all those questions. So if anybody has any questions after the fact, uh, I think there's an email address on the end. Yep, you can email Mark directly, markrich at prosvent.com, and he'll answer those questions for you. Alternatively, um, if you have any questions and the chat is already closed, then we should receive that um, in our download after the after the fact. There is a last question: What is the cost for the fancy fan setup? Yeah, so with the fan setups, there's there's a couple of different solutions which is going to affect the pricing. So if you want to have the perforated metal boxes that you fold up. Um, and you run down it, that's going to be a lot more expensive than if you were to do the duck socks. Um, and a lot of it also goes into, are you running one 10 inch fan per, per rack, or are you running one eight inch fan per each tier? Um, so there's a lot of variables that go into it. You can get it anywhere from, I mean, two to $3 a square foot for that solution, depending on how large your grow is. Of course, the larger it is, the, the least, or the smaller your square footage price is going to be but some of the perforated metal ones can get up to six or seven dollars a square foot um it's 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 all dependent on what you're looking for but you can effectively do it for a relatively cheap price okay all right well um looks like we've captured all the questions so with that we'll end early give you some time back um, again, if you have any questions, please contact Mark directly, mrich at prosvient.com, um, or you can just go to our website and fill in a contact us form and someone will get back to you with, with an answer as well. Thank you very much, Mark, and thanks for everybody to, for attending and your questions and your engagement. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.